365. Okay, we ready? Okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the April program. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about blurry blobs, dim dots, and faint fuzzies. This is another in the series on uh, beginning observer basics. Uh, and this is one where the, you know, the first in the series, we talked about just general astronomy stuff, getting into amateur astronomy. And then last month, Ralph and I talked about telescopes and gear and things like that. And so now you've, you've got a telescope, got it all set up, you finally got it on a target, and you look in the eyepiece, and now we're going to talk about what happens next, okay? Because this is one of those things where, one of those times when you're, you're so full of adrenaline and you're so excited and you look in the eyepiece and you go, it's a smudge. <laughs> what is it? Is that it? <laughs> is that it? Well, there's a lot to these uh, blurry blobs and dim dots and faint fuzzies. And when you appreciate what's going on with their history and the science and what they represent, uh, and a whole lot more, you will really begin to appreciate these more. So yes, there are a lot of faces in here that I'm not familiar with. And so uh, have you gotten a telescope? Have you looked in, had a chance? Any of you new people? Some of you? Are you looking forward to looking into a telescope? Okay, well, looking forward to looking into a telescope. There's this idea in the world called expectations. And then there's this thing called uh, getting your clicker to work right, called reality. <laughs> and it's always nice when reality exceeds expectations. A lot of times we're happy if they equal expectations, but unfortunately, many times in life, our expectations often exceed reality. And I think that this is a great example of, uh, of that exact thing here. Now, the Mead ETX-90 telescope is a tried and true instrument, been around for a long time. Uh, but, uh, but let's just kind of, I just want to take a look at this box. This is a box uh, for this telescope that I found. This is probably from sometime in the early two thousands, an astronomical telescope with electronic controller. Okay, so we do have a little, uh, a little box down here, a little, little hand controller here, but that is not a go-to controller. That is certainly not the Mead Auto Star. Uh, complete observatory system. I don't think there's a tripod in that box. I think there are three little metal rods that screw into the bottom of the base and you set it on a table. And if you were paying attention last month, uh, one of the things we tried to emphasize was the importance of having a good steady mount for your telescope. And putting one of these on those little uh, wire legs on a table is not that, but it is a complete observatory system. Ultra high resolution optics, obviously. Um, push button tracking. Now here's something that I, I looked at this and I kind of went, I really started scratching my head. This little hand controller, it won't find the target for you. You got to try and use this, um, what they are calling a finder scope. Uh, good luck with that. Um, but, uh, but it will track. And so it will follow a target once you get it acquired. The part of this that kind of makes me raise an eyebrow on land or in the sky. I'm trying to figure out exactly what you're tracking on land with, uh, uh, with this device. Uh, but it is a complete system. So what? Bird. The bird. Yeah, I don't know if it's got 80, 800 times sidereal rate to track a bird, but, uh, or else it's a really slow bird. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the, the part of this that, uh, that kind of gets the goat of a lot of people who have been into amateur astronomy for a long time, and, and uh, we really, it, it, it bothers a lot of us, and that is this picture of the Orion Nebula, because you know somebody who is not experienced is going to see that and get very excited at their complete observatory system with tracking, 
And boy, you're going to look in that eyepiece, a 25 milliliter, millimeter apostle, and you're going to see that. No. <laughs> no. What you're going to see is that, maybe. That's what, that's the reality right there. Okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the reality at Cloudland. Uh, okay. So, yeah, all of a sudden, enthusiasm is going down. What, did I, what am I getting myself into? And this, this was not cheap even back then. Um, so, why do we care? Why do we care that this is kind of false advertising? But why do we, why should we actually get excited about things? And so we have to go back and look at the history and the science behind these things, and then we can really begin to appreciate it. So we'll start with the pioneers of presbyopia. And some of us are getting there, you know, that's when your arms are not long enough to read what you need to read. I had, I, I did a presentation, a uh, little star party for Trails and Trilliums this past weekend up at Mont Eagle and uh, didn't have a real big crowd, but at least the snow had cleared out. It was still quite cold, but a person asked a really good question and, and I had to really think about it for a minute. And then I thought, you know, that's a really good question to add in right here. And he, the question he asked was did the ancients, the ancient people, see the same sky that we see? And the answer to that question is yes and no. Yes, they saw the same star patterns. The moon hasn't changed in any meaningful way. There are no new permanent objects that we can see in the sky. All the clusters are there. All of the things are there uh, that people were looking at thousands and thousands of years ago. That has not changed. But what has changed is technology, light pollution, cities, and the fact that we don't see the same view of the sky. We can see the same things, but we don't get the same view because of light pollution. And so we have been robbed of a lot of that. And so, you know, a lot of people say, you know, well, that group of stars doesn't look anything like a crab, if you're talking about cancer, or really doesn't look like a bear, unless you know where all the faint stars are to finish the constellation. Um, what were people thinking? What were they on? What were they eating? Uh, well, but yeah, what kind of mushrooms did they have for dinner? Um, but... Uh, yeah, that many, th you know, thousands of years ago, you didn't have light pollution. So you had a lot more stars to use to complete these constellations. For one thing, you, you had more choices and you could make more patterns. Uh, and they didn't have much else to do except observe the sky. But it's being passed on as oral traditions and stories in the sky and, and, and cultures around the world have their own sky lore and stories that they tell about the sky, often in oral history. It's not until the beginning of the modern or the, uh, you know, year one, that we start getting a little more systematic about things. And so we have Ptolemy. And he lived uh, year 83 to 161 A.D., and Ptolemy did something, and we think it's probably around 150 AD, a little bit different, is that he's making observations of the sky with all he has is his eye, that's all we've got, but he's recording what he sees, and he's describing what he sees. And one of the objects uh, that he would have recorded is M7. It's a, uh, I believe that's an open cluster in Scorpius um, that he could see with his naked eye. He probably could observe other clusters. The Pleiades uh, would definitely be something that he would have been able to describe. But the idea of observing, writing down your observations and describing it, that's what the galaxy challenge is and what a lot of the astronomical league challenges are. Observe it and then make a note, describe it for us. You're following in the footsteps of 
Ptolemy. Then we have to fast forward quite a bit, and we finally get to Galileo. And in 1610, uh, Galileo took an idea from Hans Lippersche in the Netherlands. Uh, Lippersche took a ground piece of glass as a lens. We'd had lenses for a while before then. Uh, put it at the end, one end of the tube, took another piece of glass, put it at the under, other end of the tube, and looked at it. It made things bigger. And Galileo said, well, I can do that. And he made him a little telescope. We, you can buy a model of it, the Galileo scope. Uh, and uh, the Galileo scope model you can buy today is probably way better than what he actually had. Uh, but uh, he took his little telescope and he aimed it to the sky. And in 1610, he pointed his telescope skyward and our understanding of the universe changed from what he saw. He resolved the hazy Milky Way into stars. He saw the cratering on the moon. He observed sunspots because there wasn't that little warning on the side of the telescope that he made that said, do not look at the sun, um, how he managed to survive. That, that, that's a testament to, you know, sometimes a poor quality telescope can save your vision. Um, he aimed his telescope at the planets and saw that Venus had phases like the moon. He saw that Jupiter had points of light that moved and danced around that planet, and that completely changed our understanding of the universe. Move on a little bit later, still about Galileo's time. In Galileo's time, another person, this is one of those people you probably haven't heard of, uh, but Nicholas Piersk, Piresk, Piresk, maybe how you say that. He aimed his telescope at other parts of the sky, and he ended up in the constellation of Orion, and he is credited in 1610 with discovering the Orion Nebula. And the view that he probably saw through his telescope was not going to be anything <laughs> like what you'll be able to see through your telescope. So you should be excited because even the least expensive uh, low-end telescopes today are miles ahead of what these folks were using. And then we get this handsome dude comes in, and now we're going to do something else. We're going from making discoveries of new things, okay? And actually, we can go back, and Piresk is going to be, we can think of him as the father of the faint fuzzies, because he would be the first one to actually telescopically observe a nebula, a cloud of gas, which by any definition is a fuzzy, okay? So, so he's the one. Uh, Johann Havelius comes in, uh, now we're some years later, and now we're going to do a step further, and we're going to start cataloging. We're going to start plotting and cataloging stars. And in 1647, he developed his star catalog, but among the stars that he had in his catalog were 14 objects that were faint, and they were fuzzy. And these were uh, very confusing. Nobody quite understood what they were, okay? And this is 37 years after Galileo, so we assume that the telescope technology has improved somewhat uh, by now. Uh, this is all happening in Europe, but then we get uh, another Frenchman, Okay, Lacai, Nicolas de Lacai, who decides to head south and see what's happening south of the equator and documenting southern hemisphere stars. And his 1755 catalog, notice we've jumped 100 years now, uh, but we're now in the age of discovery and the age of exploration and colonization and whatnot. And he's checking out what's happening down in places like Cape Town and uh, South Africa, a very important uh, trade area, access to, uh, to the east. And he also noticed all of these nebulous objects out there. So interest is starting to build. So a little bit after Lakai, 
we start to get into what we can refer to as the era of eye strain. Now we have people who are actively scanning the skies looking for faint fuzzy things. But what they're really looking for are comets. This is the era of the comet hunter. And wealthy patrons would hire uh, astronomers to find comets for them. Now, we're not going to start with the who you might think, uh, but we're going to start with his best friend, Pierre Michon. Uh, and Pierre Michon was a collaborator of Messier, who we'll get to shortly. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the Messier catalog and how that came about. But 30 of the objects on the Messier catalog were actually discovered by Pierre Michon. And one of the things about these guys is that they were friends. They collaborated. They shared information uh, with each other. Okay, so then we get to arguably the most famous comet hunter of the era, and that's Charles Messier working out of Paris for King Louis. Uh, and he is comet hunter extraordinaire and the primary nuisance notator of the group. So in the late 1700s, when you're looking for a comet, you are scanning the sky with your telescope, hoping to find something faint and fuzzy. Great, got it. Write down its position, record its position. Then you come back a few days later, put your telescope back in that position, and hopefully the object is not there. Hopefully it has moved against the background stars. If it moves, it's a comet. Bingo, got it. And Messier was a whiz at math as well. He was good at computing orbits, uh, and he was referred to, his nickname was the ferret of comets. He could, just, he could just find these things. The problem was, a lot of times he'd find his faint fuzzy, yay, look at it a few days later, it didn't move. <laughs> not a comet. And you start finding enough of these things and you start getting frustrated about it and you start talking to your friend Pierre and your friends William and, and everybody else and everybody's like, yeah, these things are all over the place. And so Messier decided that he was going to make a list of the things that were, were not comets. This was the do not bother with it list. Okay, the do not look at this list, it's not a comet. And uh, that, of course, is now the most famous list that we have uh, for amateur astronomers. And that's what the objects that we enjoy looking at the most. It's interesting that there are some things, though, that people really wonder, you know, what was Messier thinking? He knew the Pleiades, Messier 45, the 45th entry in the list, was not a comet. You can see that with your naked eye. You, can, you know it's not Comet. What was he thinking? And a lot of it was he was getting this. It was, he had to get it published. He had the first 44 things, and that just didn't, it just didn't feel right. And he had heard perhaps reports that there is some faint fuzziness around some of the stars in the Pleiades. Okay, we'll round it up to 45, get the Pleiades on there, because we might find some fuzz in there. Okay, heard about some fuzz. So that's how some things get in there. He, there were some mistakes that his original list ended up at 103, but now we think of it as 110, uh, because we added several, th several things were added uh, in the 20th century. You know, well, we think this is what it was, or here's something in his list, but you go there and there's nothing there. Oh, he missed, a, he got a, a, a mathematical sign wrong. And if you switch the sign from a negative to a positive, boom, all of a sudden there you are, uh, and so on. So his list has undergone some, uh, some uh, posthumous revision. But the thing about Messier's list is that there is no real organization to it. He just wrote things down on that list in the order he found them. <laughs> and there's no rhyme or reason to it. And that's why, you know, Messier 1 is over here, but Messier 2 is way over here, and Messier 3 is down there, and it's all over the sky, and there's absolutely no rhyme or reason to it. 
well, we can't have that now, can we? Enter William Herschel, contemporary uh, and colleague of Messier. Now, Messier is working out of Paris. Herschel is working out of England. Uh, I did a program on Herschel specifically and the whole Herschel, uh, uh, I refer to the, them as the uh, Dioptric Dynasty. Uh, William, his sister Caroline, and William's son John. Uh, we're not going to say a lot about Caroline tonight, although she is extraordinarily important. Uh, but uh, but John becomes very important in the faint fuzzy department. Uh, Herschel was actually a deserter from the uh, German army. At, well, he was accused anyway. He's actually a musician, and he was the. Uh, court musician in Bath, England, wrote a lot of amazing Baroque classical music. Uh, as a musician, you think of things as being organized. And so he gets interested in optics. He gets interested in astronomy. But he does things, remember, musician, you start at measure one, note one, and you work your way through the piece. And so he systematically observes the sky. He's not looking for anything in particular. He is scanning the sky in a very systematic manner and recording everything that he finds. He doesn't necessarily know what it is, but he is writing it down. And that's why the numbers associated with Herschel's uh, catalogs, and we'll talk about those in a minute, uh, do have rhyme and reason where they are relative to uh, right ascension of objects uh, in the sky. Of course, he was kind of just doing that on his own. He had his sister Caroline was uh, living with him and was his assistant. Um, and sure enough, he found a faint fuzzy. And the next time he put the telescope on it, it moved. Comet Com communicates with Messier, you know. Charlie, what have I got going on here? And they look at it, and yeah, it's moving. And uh, that's a fuzzy thing that moves. Everybody knows that's a comet. Messier computes the orbit. Well, that's kind of a little bit of a different orbit for a comet, but what else are you going to call it? And uh, they observe this thing and observe this thing, and eventually Herschel begins, it begins to dawn on him that this may not be a comet. Uh, and in fact, uh, he discovered the planet that he named Georgium Cytus because he was working for King George. And if King George is, is uh, paying your salary, uh, you are going to honor your king with one of your discoveries. Uh, so we almost ended up with Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, George. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't going to fly, and uh, I think the Germans swept in and said, oh, wait, wait, wait on Boda. Uh, so Bode's galaxy, uh, M82, um, he's like, no, 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 no. We got to keep with the, with the system here. And so he proposed Uranus, which is the, the god of the heavens, uh, which became, let's, you know, Uranus. But, of course, we all know that every 14-year-old boy wants you to say Uranus. So there you go. All right. But the first planet discovered since antiquity. It technically, if you have really good eyesight, really good skies, and you know exactly where to look, it is right on the edge of visibility. But the ancients would have never seen it. In fact, it would have probably been drowned out by all the stars they could see. Um, but uh, but this was uh, this was a big deal, and uh, Messier's computed the orbit of this thing. Except, wait a minute, it ain't behaving properly. And why isn't this working? And they start crunching the numbers, and they said, "Well, you know what? Make it work." If there was another object out there with a certain mass, a certain size, in a certain location, and uh, Urbain Le Verrier in France said, I think I've got it. He's like, guys, point your telescopes up here. Nobody was interested. 
the Germans, uh, I think it was Hella, said, oh, okay. You know, he communicated with him. He said, okay. He aimed his telescope where Leverrier told him to aim it. Bam, there was planet. There was Neptune. Oh, well, uh, what became Neptune. So the first, so Herschel, the first person to discover a planet telescopically. Neptune, the first planet dis discovered by math. All because we're looking at the faint fuzzies. A little bit later, well, okay, so another thing about Herschel, and we'll get to this a little bit. Herschel made his own telescopes, and his telescopes were much, much beefier than Messier's. Messier used a lot of small refractors. He did use some small uh, reflectors, but Herschel was really good at grinding mirrors, and Herschel was eventually working with a 40-inch reflector, which I believe is the one he discovered Uranus with. Uh, but, you know, in the vein of go big or go home, we get, uh, having to click over here, here we go, uh, we get William Parsons, Lord Ross of Ireland, who very much one-ups Herschel, but not in terms of telescopes, but not so much to make new discoveries, but to refine the discoveries that uh, Méchon and Messier and the Herschels had made. And so what were they looking through? And I've already alluded to the fact that, uh, you know, Galileo's telescopes and, uh, and these people back in the 1600s were just, how can they even see anything through them? The color fringing and everything would have been horrific. As we get into the 1700s, we're getting much higher quality but still, the telescopes that most of us have out on the observing field today, they would have killed to have something of the quality of that. Uh, so I can't even say that word. Uh, nystagmatizing instruments. Uh, here is a drawing. This is, this is uh, a picture of Messier at one of his telescopes. Uh, this is one of the telescopes that Herschel constructed himself, ground the mirror and everything. These were the kinds of instruments they were using. Uh, Herschel's 40 inch, you actually didn't have an eyepiece that came out the side. Instead, you actually sat in front and, the, and your eyepiece was looking down the telescope tube at the mirror, at the point of focus, at the end of the tube. Uh, yeah, it was pretty pretty rickety setup, but it got the job done. Um, I think this is a, about an eight or a 10 inch telescope. This is probably a six inch telescope and look at how long it is. Um, but uh, uh, Parsons says, oh, I don't think so. And so that's Parsons telescope. That's a 72 inch telescope, which was the largest telescope in the world until the 100 inch Hooker telescope in the early 1900s, or uh, when, was, when was the Hooker telescope? 1920s, somewhere around there. Um, so this reigned as the largest telescope in the world. Uh, it only moved in one direction. It only moved up and down. You had altitude, that's it, that's all you had. You couldn't go side to side with it. So what he had to do was let the sky move and then he could look at things as objects moved into view as the earth rotated is the only way he could do it. Now the mirrors they were using uh, at this time, aluminum, I don't think so. In fact, aluminum doesn't become uh, something you can actually work with until well into the 1800s. It was a metal that was more precious than platinum or gold uh, because we simply hadn't figured out that the aluminum is the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust and how to get it out. I mean, we think of aluminum as just a throwaway material today, but back then that was a big deal. No, we didn't have aluminized glass mirrors. It was a copper and tin alloy called speculum and it tarnished pretty fast. I believe he had two mirrors. And after a relatively short period of time, weeks, you had to take that mirror out, put the clean mirror in, you had to get the tarnish off of the first mirror 
and you had to make sure you didn't change the figure in the mirror when you did it. It was quite an operation. All right, so we're starting to find this stuff. It's not enough to just find it. We're now getting into an age where we realize the importance of keeping track of things. And so we had some systems. We had to come up with some systems to work this out. And so the first real system is Messier's catalog. Um, ended up with 103 objects. But here's number one. Uh, and that's uh, diffuse. Uh, and this is in French, nebuleuse or whatever. Uh, I, I can sort of read French. But it's in the uh, horn near the meridian of, to of Taurus. It doesn't contain a star, so he couldn't see a star in it. Um, it was very, it was faint and washed out, and uh, he was uh, trying to observe. It was he found it near the comet that had been uh, discovered in 1758, but it was just the first one he decided to write down. And as I said, subsequent to. Uh, uh, to Messier's original 103, we've added seven more uh, objects to that list that we believe probably should have been on that list and uh, we're very confident that he had actually observed. But this is just a hodgepodge. So the Herschels are going to get serious about it. And William Herschel observed a lot. And he had a huge amount of data. And his son, John, says, we got to start compiling this. And John also traveled in the Southern Hemisphere and was adding even more objects. And so in 1864, we get the general catalog of astronomical objects with 5,079 objects. These are star clusters, nebulae, spiral nebulae, uh, the assorted bits of fluff and blurriness that we were seeing in the eyepiece. And that got us through until a little while later when this fella came on the scene. And JLE Dreher says, okay, we're now several years later, we're now going to be about 20 years later, we've added more objects we need to go back and review things. Actually, if we go back here, it says arranged in order of right ascension and reduced to the common epoch 1860 with predictions computed for the epoch to 1880. So you have to adjust the, the numbers, the coordinates, because of the Earth's wobble on its axis to take into account precession. Uh, and so Dreyer does that. And so what do you call it? Okay, you call it the new general catalog. He took John Herschel's original general catalog, added the new stuff to it, and updated it to the new uh, coordinates or the latest coordinates. And so now when you, see, you don't see GC numbers anymore, usually. Instead, you see NGC numbers. And a lot of the objects that we look at have NGC numbers on it, and that's Dreyer back in 1888. So yeah, it's not exactly new anymore, but it's still really useful. Dreyer didn't stop there. As time went on, uh, in 1895, he added another 1529 in 1908. So we're 20 years later, he adds another 5,000 objects. You can see that we're really building up a, a, a supply here, but We'd already had the numerical order of the NGC numbers, and you couldn't fit these in because you can't have some. You can't have NGC thirty six ninety two point five. Okay, that's beginning to sound like a Star Trek star date. Okay, so rather than try and fit things in, we just tacked things on the end, and that became the index catalogs, and those are the IC numbers that you will see in lists of objects that we observe. Okay, so that's how they got their list. But what did they actually see? This is what Messier saw when he looked at M42. 
and he is looking through a, uh, a relatively high quality refractor at the time designed by Delon. Uh, it's about a 90 millimeter objective. So the telescope box of the ETX 90 that I started with, that's a 90 millimeter telescope. This is what Messier saw through a 90 millimeter telescope that was, you know, 90 millimeters is going to be about that big around, but the telescope itself was three and a half feet long <laughs> because you fix the color problems by having long focal lengths. This is almost exactly the view that you will see when you look through our telescopes. The trapezium, the three stars here. Now, he didn't quite get uh, M40, this would be M43 right here, but, or actually, no, that's M43 down here. Um, but, uh, but this almost, to me, it looks like a bat or a bird or a spider. Uh, that is very close to what I see when I look into my telescopes uh, today. And so the next time you look at M42 and you go, well, that's pretty, it's just kind of fuzzy, but think that is exactly the view that Messier saw when he was looking in it, okay? That, that's meaningful to me. Uh, Herschel, remember he had some bigger telescopes, but he was using reflectors with some pretty hard, high maintenance mirrors. But these are some of his drawings. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, I can't draw, when you have to sketch out things, and yes, on the Galaxy Challenge, I took EAA pictures, and so did John. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, that's what Herschel was doing. <laughs> you can drive if this is getting by. If this is what William Herschel does, you're going to be good, okay? Um, and he had no idea what most of. But I mean, hello, faint fuzzies, blurry blobs. He's got it all. And then. <clears throat> Uh, Parsons comes along with his 72-inch, <clears throat> talk about aperture fever, and uh, this is what he sees. So this, y'all recognize this object? Okay, it's M51, Whirlpool Galaxy. This is what Herschel was seeing, a little bit of structure in there and the other bright patch off to the side. But you get 72 inches of speculum mirror on it, that's pretty darn good. You are seeing some structure. And so this is what, uh, what Parsons, uh, Ross mean, is referring to Lord Ross. That's William Parsons. This is what he saw when he looked at M51. And this is a modern uh, picture of M51, photograph of M51. Uh, that's pretty darn good. Okay. But you don't want to try and haul a 72 inch telescope to a star party. It's not going to be a fun thing. So what are these things? What are these things? <laughs> Nobody, we're just beginning now to understand what some of these things are. So this is M97, the Owl Nebula. This is a drawing by William Parsons. Um, but people think he got just a little, bit carried away with a couple of stars in there. Um, no, those stars aren't there. But boy, wouldn't it be cool if they were. <laughs> um, what are these things? These things are open star clusters, globular star clusters, nebulae of different types, spiral nebulae, which are of great significance to us, and double stars and multiple star systems. So let's take kind of a, just a real quick tour of what these things are. And, and I have purposely selected imagery here to approximate what you would see in the eyepiece. So this is M35, NGC 2168. It's an open cluster in Gemini. It's a really great object to see, and it's out now, uh, but it won't be up for very much longer. Um, Open clusters are stars that were born together. So when you look at the Orion Nebula, you know, you see the wispy gas clouds and it's like, oh, that's cool. And in and, and like Hubble's space telescope pictures, 
you actually miss the really important part. And that is those four stars concentrated with a little clear area around them called the trapezium. Those are stars that are actually in the process of forming. That's a star forming region. And what's going to happen over time is the Orion Nebula is going to turn into an open cluster. There will be an open cluster similar to what we would see here. Stars that are born together, they're interacting with each other. As far as we know, they're all within the Milky Way galaxy. Messier recorded 30 of these. There are 30 open clusters in the Messier catalog. 1,200, and there are, that we have observed and identified probably a lot more than that, a lot more than that. Then they saw globular clusters. Now, M13 is one that with a moderate amount of aperture is a wow in the telescope. Um, but globular clusters are different. These are very dense masses of stars. They are thought to be extremely old. And when you look at the spectra of the stars, they are all, uh, there are no blue or there are very few blue stars. They're all uh, in the yellow golden stars fairly, very old. It's thought that many of these may be as old as the galaxy. They're not actually found in the galaxy, but these are an extragalactic phenomenon. They form a halo around the Milky Way and they're orbiting around. And I think of it like if you had a light bulb and the moths are flying around the light bulb and that's how the uh, globular clusters are moving. We have even found globular clusters around other galaxies. Okay, we know the Magell Magellanic clouds have globular clusters. Uh, M31, the Andromeda galaxy, has globular clusters as well. Um, Messier had 29 of these in his uh, catalog. And so coming up after the uh, galaxy uh, uh, challenge, is going to be a globular cluster challenge and summertime is globular cluster time. So that'll be the next thing that uh, that we'll be working on as a club. Uh, we think there are around 150. Oh, there are probably more, but this is what we have uh, what we have discovered. And then you get the nebulae. Now the nebulae were really confusing because they take a lot of different forms. And so back in Herschel's day, they would look at these objects and, well, they were round like planets, but they weren't orbiting, they weren't moving, so they obviously weren't planets in the solar system, but they looked like planets and they were faint and they were fuzzy and faint fuzzy things are nebulae, planetary nebulae. Uh, so M57, the ring nebula, we now understand that they have, for one thing, nothing to do with planets, but in fact, they are stars that have reached the end of their life. They swell up, they poof off an outer shell of gas. The rest of it collapses down into a white dwarf. It is, uh, this is going out with a whimper. <laughs> then we have diffuse nebulae, uh, reflection nebulae. Uh, so this is uh, the comet nebula, M78. Uh, it is reflecting light from stars around it. Uh, and then emission nebulae, this would be Orion, and this is stars embedded in the nebula as they're forming, and the radiation from those stars is ionizing the gas in the cloud. And so the gas itself is actually emitting light, not reflecting light. And then we had a bunch of areas where we had these dark places. And there's a dark place you might recognize. And that dark place right there is Barnard 33. People thought that this was just an area where there weren't stars. But E.E. E. Barnard recognized, no, this is material that's obscuring the stars behind it. This is one of the reasons why we're very excited with JWST because JWST is going to be looking down in the infrared wavelengths. Hubble doesn't look down there. And when you're looking through infrared, you can look through these dark nebulae 
and see what's going on. We're going to get a much, much, much better picture of things. Uh, Messier had 11 of these in total, and but who knows how many. Uh, another one we could add on here, and I should have had added it on here because they are a couple of uh, one is a meh object, except it was the first in Messier's catalog. Uh, the other one Messier didn't observe, but uh, Herschel did, and that is supernova remnants. And so the Crab Nebula M1, the Veil Nebula in Cygnus, these are where supernova stars exploded in violent explosion and threw off uh, uh, gases that are now being illuminated by uh, the what's left in the, in the center. And then we have the spiral nebulae. And when you look in a telescope, even a pretty good sized telescope, yeah, that's about what you see right there. I didn't know what these things were. They had a lot of different shapes. And up until 1926, it was thought that these were objects just like all the rest of the objects within the Milky Way galaxy. Now remember, the BAS, we're fixing to celebrate our 100th anniversary next year. So we started in 1923. When the BAS was founded, that was the Andromeda Nebula thought to be part of the Milky Way galaxy. Well, now we know different. And we know different because of a name that everybody knows. Uh, gentleman was taking pictures of Andromeda using work from uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt and Annie Jump Cannon and these, I mean, there's some very important, we need to have somebody do a program on female astronomers because they are like a lot of behind the scenes folks who are really instrumental in our understanding of things. Um, but uh, she had discovered an interesting relationship in a particular kind of variable star that allowed us to use it as a so-called standard candle and use it to compute distances. And this dude found a Cepheid variable is what they're called. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute, there's a Cepheid variable in this thing. Using the 100 inch telescope, Hooker telescope, do the math. I don't think so. Do the math again. Uh, do the math again because he was getting values in the one to two million light year range. And that cannot be in the Milky Way. Okay. And I know that a lot of y'all know his name, so quiet, Bobby. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about? You know his name. Everybody knows his name. <laughs> He's got a telescope named after him. <laughs> That'd be Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble. And that's why he got a space telescope named after him. Uh, not only that, but he is also the one who discovered that the that not only were these not in the Milky Way, but they were moving away from us. Well, not that one. Uh, and the whole idea of redshift and expansion of the universe and everything tumbled out of that little faint fuzzy right there. Okay. Uh, galaxies come in a lot of different forms. Messier had 39 of them in his catalog, but he didn't really have a clue what they were. Um, there are thousands and thousands and thousands. When the uh, corrected JWST image came in of that star, so the first image had 18 stars, one for each mirror. It was the same star, 18 times. And they used that to calibrate it and get the mirrors aligned. Then they got the one with the one star. And I was even showing that to Heather. And I'm like, that's cool. But look, galaxy, galaxy, galaxy. There's a bunch of galaxies behind that thing. Oh, JWST is going to be fun, fun, fun. Multiple stars. Um, so we have optical doubles. They just happen to be in line of sight. We have binary systems where they're actually associated with each other. Uh, they are interesting targets. I personally enjoy 
looking at double stars. I, I get a lot of pleasure out of those. Um, Messier um, had um, mm, um, one, <laughs> but he was working off of somebody else said, hey, Charlie, check this out. I saw some fuzziness around it. Okay. And um, notice we're up to number 40, a nice round number. And Messier observed it. And evidently, he did not see the nebulosity, but he trusted the report that he was getting. And he needed another one to get up to a round number, put it in. Uh, and that's why he, there's a double star in there. <laughs> well, not for the ones in his catalog. He was, he was getting paid by the comet. Um, the Struves, uh, father and son, uh, they have extensive catalogs of double stars. And when you're looking at a sky atlas, if you see a capital Sigma in front uh, with a number by a star, that's, uh, that's the Struve catalog, double star catalog. All right, and then this dude comes up, okay? Our hero, okay? And so Tom's announcement tonight of finding his, uh, the copy that is our copy of the original Milky Way Atlas, Barnard is credited as being the first person to go, hey, wait a minute, let's take a picture of this stuff. He may not have been the first person to do it, but he was the driving force behind it. Um, Cameras are different than eyes. Eyes are real time. Those photons hit, they are converted to electrical impulses to your brain and that's it, but it's happening as we go. But a camera can accumulate the light. See, your eye doesn't do that. Your eye, you use it and it's done, but the camera can accumulate the light. And that means we can see way more detail. That means we can see way dimmer objects. And now, as we're into the space telescope age, and it's not just Hubble up there. There's the Chandra X-ray, um, uh, Spitzer, all kinds of telescopes up there. Uh, it's just Hubble is the most famous because it's looking in the wavelengths that we see. Uh, but uh, JWST is going to be looking in different and very important wavelengths. We can choose the light we look at, even going all the way down to radio. Uh, radio waves. And so uh, Barnard, very important uh, in helping us understand uh, what we're seeing. And so, you know, why can't I see that? That's what M31 looks like in your telescope. That's what M31 looks like in Dennis Sprinkle's, you know, astronomy camera. <laughs> That's what the Pleiades looks like through a pair of binoculars. That's what it looks like through Kevin Hahn's EAA setup out at Cloudland Canyon, okay? No, you can't see all of that. But to see this and understand the significance of it, yeah, that's nice and that's pretty, but this is what the original people who were doing this stuff, that's what they were seeing. Uh, so why should you bother with these things? Why should we get excited about them? Well, every time you look in the eyepiece, it is a unique experience. Those photons are yours. Here's our Crab Nebula supernova remnant. The photons of light have been emitted by these objects, and some of these objects are tens of millions of light years away. They've traveled for tens of millions of light years without hitting anything, made it all the way through the Earth's atmosphere, made it through the lens or bounced off the mirror of your telescope and ended up in your eyeball. That's kind of special. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I look at these things and I just think about how small it makes me feel. Oh no, when you look at this through the eyepiece of a telescope, there is a direct physical connection between you and that object. You are connected by a train of photons. And those are all your photons. Nobody else is ever going to see those photons. And that's special. Uh, your skills improve. The more, and, and so, you know, you don't just look at them once. It's a big mistake to look at and say, yeah, that's a blurry blob. Show me something else. But no, you, ha you go back. We all go back again and again and again looking at these things because 
the more you look at them, the more you see. You develop skills like averted vision where you can see even more. Uh, you maybe get in to start sketching and that helps you to see more. Okay, so it really develops your observing skills. Uh, and hopefully it gets you curious about, you know, what is this thing? Where did it come from? Uh, maybe you're looking at that open cluster and maybe there's somebody on a planet orbiting one of those stars with a telescope looking back at us. Wouldn't that be cool? I hope that's happening. You're following in the footsteps of amazing people, amazing people. And you're creating genuine cosmic connections with this. Okay. So, you know, why should you fuss with fuss with the fuzzies? Well, I think Nicola, Nicholas Louis de Lacay, remember him? Really summed it up, okay? The stars which are called nebulae offer to the eyes of the observers a yet varying spectacle, which for their exact and detailed description can occupy long times of an astronomer and give place for philosophers to do a large number of curious reflections. I like that. I think Ralph likes that. <laughs> so, Dumbbell Nebula, another uh, uh, planetary nebula. Be wild about the blurs, the light in these dots, and flip over the fuzzies because they really have a rich, important history. They're scientifically interesting, and, and by golly, they're just beautiful. What I got. Gerald, can you get that switch right there? Supernova time. Pow. Ooh. <laughs> Questions or comments or. Yeah, that's because everybody tuned out about slide three. Tom. One thing that's interesting is we look at all pre-photographic astronomy mm -hmm. you can really tell why they call it the owl yeah no just looking at it in the telescope yeah you can see the dark eye spots and it's some of these were quite uh quite descriptive whirlpools and sombreros and black eyes and yeah you know, the photographs will even the early photos show a lot more detail yeah. than you can that, that. It almost washes out some of the, and takes too much detail, can almost be too much detail sometimes. Yeah, look at that one right there. <laughs> yeah, there's a faint fuzzy taken with a camera. <laughs> Anybody else got anything they want to add? I hope that I added something to your evening and that it was worth the hour that you've sat here to listen to all this. You got, you got whereby accolades. From <laughs> <laughs> and and, and if, they, if anyone whereby has a question, type it in the chat and I'll relay it while the speakers are. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll be happy. So Chris is saying that uh, if you have any questions, put it in the chat and uh, and I'll get them and I'll be happy to uh, to respond to them. All right. Thank you all very much. We'll see you at the see you at the